Hello, my name is Barry Morris. I'm GM of the AWS uh, In Memory Databases Group, and I have with me Kevin McGeehy, our principal engineer. Uh, we're here to tell you some exciting news about the things that we've been doing uh, in the Elasticash uh, product uh, range. And um, what we're perhaps going to do is for me to spend a bit of time just giving you a bit of background about the kinds of applications that we care about. Uh, and also about the about why Elastic Hash is a good fit for that, uh, but we'll give Kevin as much time as possible to talk about the exciting new things that we've been doing. Um, in terms of applications, um, it's all about scale, really, from a data management perspective. Um, whether you're whether you're thinking about uh, the millions of, of, of interactions per second, or you're thinking about microsecond level latencies, whether you're thinking about uh, millions of, of concurrent users, uh, very large data sets, terabytes, petabytes. Uh, or global, all of these kinds of requirements are actually part of what we think of as hot data applications um, and are suited to the sorts of things that we do. Uh, it turns out these are what a lot of modern ap applications look like. And by the way, they're going to become more like that. All of the numbers that we've just talked about are going to become more la larger and more demanding over time. Um, the AWS solution to this, of course, is that uh, we have a range of, of data management uh, uh, services, uh, ranging from relational through to, to document and to, and, 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 and to, and to wide to, to, to wide column and to, and to time series and so on. And one of those is in memory, which is ourselves. Um, these uh, often, uh, the Elastic Hash uh, products are used uh, on their own as, as primary data stores. But quite often, uh, they're used actually in conjunction with these other systems um, to provide uh, responsiveness for UIs or for other, other low latency requirements. And so if you have applications that are using these other databases, it may well be that uh, it would be wise to use Elastic Hash alongside of that. Within the Elastic Hash in memory um, database group, we already have two different things, one of which is called MemcacheD, which is based on the MemcacheD open source software, and the other is, is Redis. And um, MemcacheD is, is the minimalist solution. Um, it, it, is, it has all the benefits of that and the, and, and, and the limitations of that. So it is simple, it is fast, it is easy to use, it doesn't try to do too much, but what it does, it does extremely well. Uh, Redis is a, a superset in, in, of, of that capability, um, uh, and, but 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 is but is not as simple and is not a, in, in some respects it's not as as, as uh, high performance either. Um, and if you look, both of them are, are really great for uh, use cases like caching use cases, uh, like session stores. Uh, but Redis is much more of a of, of a of a real database, an in-memory database, and so it does a lot of other things. It, it is being used increasingly for microservices kinds of applications, for gaming leaderboards, for geospatial applications, and, and many others. Um, and so that's really you choose whichever one fits what you're what you're trying to do. Both of them are engines within our our model. I want to uh, talk a little bit more about Redis. We talk about it as, as the most loved uh, data store out there. And for many years now, it has, been, it has won that accolade uh, from the Stack Overflow uh, uh, re uh, sort of survey of, of, of engineers. And uh, so people love Redis. Why is that? Well, it is a key value store. Um, and, so, uh, and, and so you no doubt understand it does puts and gets like most key, key value stores. But it's a little bit more. It has the ability where the values actually are different types of data structures. And so these include some of those that, that you can see here. They, there are strings, but there are also lists and, hash, and hashes and sets and, and, and sorted sets and so on. And the database engine understands them. And there are upwards of 200 commands that you can use to manipulate those, th th those data structures remotely from your application. Um, and it does that, of course, at microsecond level latencies. And it does that with, with, that within Elastic Hash. It does that with, with the high, high availability that you get from multi-AZ and so on. So, um, so it's really about that programming model that people really, re really love about Redis. And it's the reason that it's such a popular engine out there. And that's perhaps not obvious what, what that all means. So perhaps just diving in and giving you a quick example will help. Uh, here's an example of using a sorted set data structure. 
um, uh, which in this case is called leaderboard. And so we, 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 we're sending a message across the, the network to the database engine to say, create a leaderboard data structure and add these four different things, these four different records to it, if you like, uh, using the zadd command, which is a sorted set command. So we're saying add Andy and Bob and Carl and Derek with the following scores. Um, and then we're able to go back to it from obviously the same client or some other client on the other side of the world and say, what's currently in that data structure. And so you use, in this case, the zrev range command, uh, and you give it the, the, the name of the data structure. And in this case, we're saying from item zero to item minus one, which means all of them. And we get them back, and we get them back in the right order because Derek had the highest score. And so you see that Derek's ahead, and that's what sorted sets do. There's a zrev rank command and, and many other commands. The zrev rank command says, tell us where Bob is in the list. And it says he's second in the list. He's index one. You can also update it, of course, it's a database, or someone from the other side of the world can update it uh, by saying Z add leaderboard and a new score for Carl. And when we take a look at what's in there, we find that Carl is now the head of it. Um, and so that's the basic model. There are security constraints on this, of course. There's certain people that can update it and not update it. You can control all of that. But that's the basic idea. And of course, all of these commands, uh, which are here, if you like, typed at a command line, uh, are the same commands that you would send from your programming language within your application. So what's the difference between that and and Elastic Hash, because that's really, really core Redis, that's what Redis does. Elastic Hash adds for both of these engines, adds scalability, performance, manageability, or well, it fully manages it, um, and maintains compatibility with that OSS API. And just drilling a bit into, into Redis to give you an example of this, you know, in terms of performance, the, the performance um, work that we've done um, is up and down the stack, optimizations of the code, optimizations of I.O., uh, also deployments on the right instances, deployments within outposts and, and local zones, um, performance-related things that make Elastic Hash faster and, 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 and better in that sense than the standard uh, open source code. Um, it's also secure, like every, uh, like every AWS service is AWS service is committed to security. And so you'll see that we've got role-based based access control, we've got encryption at rest, we've got encryption in transit, and so on. It's fully managed, uh, of course, because that's really why people will use a managed service is that it's managed and you don't have to do the tedious stuff. You don't have to deploy the hardware. You don't have to do software updates. You don't have to do the backups. Those all get done for you, fully managed. Um, it's Redis compatible. Redis 6 actually is the latest version of Redis, and, it's, and, and it's, uh, it, is, it supports Redis 6, and we will continue, obviously, to, to do that. That's the reason that people use Elastic Hash for Redis, and so obviously it's going to maintain compatibility. Um, highly reliable, your cache is something you don't want to go away, particularly if it's a multi-terabyte cache. Um, so, uh, so it has reliability, it has multi-AZ, it has the ability to replicate across regions, um, and scalable. If you've got a, an application which today is small, but tomorrow is going to be very large, we can take it to 500 shards and, and hundreds of terabytes in size, if that's what you need to do. Um, just briefly to talk about customers, we obviously have very large numbers of customers, um, and many of them are in fact using it as a cache, um, and, and that's a, the two, two, two first customers here would be good examples. Expedia, that you probably know, a travel company, and Grab, which is a ride-hailing company. Both of them are able to serve up a lot of the data that they need for the user interface um, directly from the cache and don't have to go to the database um, below. Many customers will find that 30, 40, 50 percent of the data um, uh, can, can be served directly from the cache with extraordinary benefits to the user interface and, of course, offloading from the data, backend database engines as well. GE, uh, this is a slightly different use case, and it's an example of, of, of maintaining session state. So metadata about sessions uh, for applications that their customers are building um, using, uh, using container technology. So uh, a wide variety of, of examples, and of course we have very large numbers of customers doing this um, at scale, but thought I'd just love to give you a bit of a picture of that. With that, what I'm going to do is hand over to, uh, to Kevin, who's going to dig deeper into some of the new things that we've been doing um, with, uh, with Elastic Hash. Thank you, Barry, for that introduction to Elastic Hash. My name is Kevin, and I'm a principal engineer on the Elastic Hash team. And I'm here to talk to you today about what exciting things we've built in 2020. The Elastic Hash team has been pretty hard at work building new functionality in 2020 across many different fronts. 
For performance, we introduced Graviton2 instance support for improved price performance and added support for AWS outposts and local zones to further reduce latency between ElastiCache and end users. For security, we added resource level API permissions on our management interface and role-based access control on the data plane for Redis. We also improved auto, the support for auto update of clusters for security purposes. On microservice integration, we added support for ElastiCache within AWS controllers for Kubernetes to ease the resource management for container-based workloads. To improve scalability and availability, we introduced Global Data Store, our ability to provision cross-region ElastiCache clusters, and extreme scale with 500 node clusters. Finally, for OSS compatibility, we added Redis 6 support, which introduces role-based access control, as well as support for client-side caching, and the latest version of Memcache in Memcache 1.6. Let's dive into some of the performance features I just listed. So AWS Graviton2 is the second generation of ARM chips that were designed by Amazon. Our customers gave us feedback that supporting ARM was a great step forward, and we've been pushed to innovate faster and improve performance even further. These CPUs are built using custom 64-bit Neoverse cores built using groundbreaking seven nanometer silicon process, representing our continued investment in building custom silicon solutions. The new Graviton2 processors deliver up to four times the number of compute cores and up to five times faster memory than the previous generation. With the adoption of these processors and instances within ElastiCache, it's now possible to bring new classes of workloads into the cloud. So we took the Graviton2 instances and tried them out in ElastiCache. We saw improvements in price performance right away and we're continuing to invest in these instances further to improve performance. In our latest benchmarks, we'll see up to 60% uh, improvement in price performance over the prior M5 generation. For ElastiCast especially, always on DRAM encryption that's provided by these instances is a nice feature to have, so that even with direct hardware access, your data is safe. Elasticash supports the M6G and R6G node families, which allow data set sizes to range from 6 gigabytes to over 400 gigabytes, depending on your need, within a single node. These instances are available today in 10 regions worldwide for seamless upgrades of your existing clusters or for brand new launches. The next initiative we launched this past year to improve performance is AWS Local Zones. What is a local zone? Well, most local workloads work pretty well on the existing availability zones that we provide, but for some more latency-sensitive applications, a more localized deployment of infrastructure closer to end users is beneficial. Local zones are designed to bring the core services needed for those latency-sensitive portions of your app closer to end users, while you still have access to the original availability zones to provide the full array of AWS services. You can think of local zones as an extension or expansion of infrastructure in geographies that might be closer to your end customers based on their usage. Local zones eliminate the need to procure, operate, and maintain your own IT infrastructure in data centers or co-locations, or to build and run specific low latency, high demand workloads on separate infrastructure. This results in a lot less effort of having to maintain yet another infrastructure and technology stack. Instead, local zones allow you to use the uniform AWS Cloud APIs, tooling, and services that you're used to with no added effort to gain proximity to your users or their audience. Local zones are increasingly relevant for high demanding applications that require single digit millisecond latency to your end users. If you think about it, Redis can already provide single digit millisecond latency to applications running within an availability zone. With local zones, you can move the entire stack closer to the end user, allowing them even faster access to the applications that they'd have before. For example, in media and content creation, which includes latency-sensitive workloads like live production and video editing, uh, these, these are representative of a, an ideal use case for local zones. For example, your common media assets used by these applications could be stored inside Redis for lightning quick access. For example, uh, next, uh, real-time multiplayer gaming can take advantage of local zones. 
to deploy latency sensitive portions of the game servers to run the multiplayer game sessions. As an example, your leaderboard or other score data could be stored in a local Redis instance to rapidly compute winners and losers. Similarly, customers can innovate faster by allowing chip designers and verification engineers to solve complex compute intensive and latency sensitive problems using application and desktop streaming services that are hosted within the AWS local zone. Finally, for machine learning initiatives, data scientists are able to easily host and train models continuously for high performance inferencing using a local zone. In all these applications, as well as others, there's a clear benefit from the features and functionality of ElastiCache alongside the even further reduced latency of running in a local zone. From an AWS region, you can seamlessly extend your VPC into a local zone by just creating a subnet and associating it with a local zone, just as you would associate a subnet with an availability zone within the AWS cloud. ElastiCache can be deployed on this subnet and run a cluster within the local zone closer to the end users that are accessing it. This diagram looks fairly similar to a normal regional deployment for ElastiCache, uh, though the other services that do not support local zones would be accessed across the availability zones. You can get started with local zones today within US West 2 from CLI or Management Console. AWS Outposts is similar to local zones, but is designed for workloads that need to remain on premise. Outposts is a fully managed and configurable compute and storage offering built and supported by AWS. It brings the AWS cloud experience to a customer's physical location, enabling customers to run applications that need to remain on premise. It allows you to develop once and deploy in the cloud or on-premise without having to rewrite your applications in between. With Outpost, you have the same hardware and, infra and software infrastructure uh, and a consistent set of services and tools across the two environments to build and run modern cloud-native applications that are running in your premise. Outposts are fully managed and supported by AWS and automatically where AWS automatically manages and, and updates the outposts as part of ongoing operations as part of the public region. So you don't have to worry about updating or patching your infrastructure when running on an outpost. And an advantage is you can use the same AWS console to view and manage your resources, whether they're in the cloud or on-premise. Similarly, you can use the same AL, uh, AWS CLI and SDK to, that you use today to run and deploy these applications along with the same API endpoints. So why is there a need for outposts in addition to local zones? Well, there's a few reasons why your applications may need to remain on premise. First, let's talk about latency sensitive applications. As we've talked about with local zones, some of your applications may be sensitive to total latency or variability in latency. You may need these to run on premise to support these processes, providing a better experience for your end users or to maintain a competitive advantage. A second reason is uh, for local data processing needs. There's been an exponential increase in the amount of data that's being generated by users, and transmitting this data over long distances can be expensive or slow. Instead, a cloud-native service such as ElastiCache can be used in this hybrid scenario to store your data locally and serve it, seamless, serve it seamlessly to applications that are deployed in the cloud. Another reason for an on-premise footprint is applications with data residency requirements. You may have to operate in a geographical jurisdiction where your regulations dictate that infrastructure has to be within a specific country, or you may do business where contracts specify exactly where the applications are deployed. And for all these reasons, outposts may be beneficial to your application. Similar to running ElastiCache on a local zone, you can seamlessly extend your VPC on-premise using our management APIs by first creating a subnet associated with your outpost, the same way you would create a subnet in an availability zone. You can then use that subnet to deploy a cluster that is effectively running on your infrastructure within the outpost. All the data within that cluster would be contained within your hardware, and applications also running within outposts can take advantage of the sub-millisecond local data access. Even though the cluster is running within your outpost, it's still being monitored and administrated by the service within ElastiCache. And so we can detect and remediate any problems similar to the behavior you get running within a normal availability zone. 
Next, let's talk about some of the advancements we made in terms of uh, compatibility with open source. So Redis launched uh, version 6.0 in April of 2020. And Elasticash then followed up shortly after with support for it after we tested and qualified it internally. There's a number of exciting features in Redis 6, including role-based access control, which I've talked a little bit about. This replaces some of the authentication and authorization mechanisms that were available in earlier versions and allows you to define separate users with individual permissions. I'll go into a little bit more detail about this in a few minutes. Redis 6 also introduces support for client-side caching, where the server will track the requests that are coming in from users and send invalidation messages when a read item gets updated. This opens the door for client-side caching libraries to be built so that you can reduce caching latency even further since it eliminates a network hop to retrieve data. There were also several meaningful operational improvements that were introduced in 6.0, including an Elasticatch feature to improve replication and snapshotting under low memory conditions, and an open source feature to improve the expiry algorithm to reclaim memory faster. And as part of Redis 6, we've also enhanced our management interface to automatically manage minor versions of Redis on behalf of customers. Customers have told us that it's a pain that they had to manually choose to upgrade their clusters when new versions came out. So we worked to provide a more seamless upgrade experience to make sure all of nodes were able to get the latest bug fixes and improvements. Role-based access control is one of the biggest new features in Redis 6, like I just talked about. This functionality enhances the security posture of Redis significantly over previous versions. Before Redis 6, there was only one user, a default user, and an optional auth token that acted as a shared secret between the server and the client. Once authenticated, the default user could access all of the data and all of the commands, but you could hide specific commands by renaming them to prevent access. With Redis 6, you can create multiple independent users, each with their own passwords. More importantly, you can define access restrictions for each user, which is something you couldn't do before, allowing or denying access to specific keys or sets of keys and commands. These users can be updated dynamically in an online fashion, and Elasticash emits metrics for authentication and authorization failures so that you can identify problems across your clusters. Let's take a look at an example of how you would use these new features. Let's say I want to launch uh, the Redis command line interface against my primary with the user I've predefined that has a password and is allowed to only run read commands, which means that any command that mutates the database like a set or append would be rejected. So I can launch Redis CLI here against the primary endpoint. My user's named read only. After I put in my password, I can access keys as expected. But if I try to execute a disallowed command like set, I'll get an error message back, and that metric would be logged. Similarly, you can define different users who have access to only a subset of keys. In this example, let's say I created a user called marketing that has only access to keys with a specific marketing prefix. So I can set these keys, and I can read keys with this prefix. If I try to access a key without this prefix, however, I'll get an error message, and that metric would be logged. So to begin using these, this new functionality with role-based access control, you can simply upgrade your cluster to Redis 6, and then you can make use of our management APIs to help define and manipulate these users. Next, let's talk about some of the advancements we've made to microservice integration. AWS Controllers for Kubernetes is an exciting project that allows developers to define and use AWS managed resources directly from Kubernetes tooling. It provides a unified, seamless way to manage your applications that are managed by Kubernetes and, and dependencies which may reside in the AWS cloud. Elasticash recently launched a controller for this project, and it's in developer preview. And it supports the critical resources for interacting with Elasticash, namely replication groups, subnet groups, and snapshots. As you can see, there's many other services participating in this project. And the goal is to provide unified access to the AWS portfolio over time. Let's take a look at how you would use this. 
For ElastiCache, we defined a custom resource definition, and you can specify attributes about your cluster that you use during creation. In this example of a policy document in YAML, we've named our cluster reInvent, and we specified that we want it to be a three shard T3 micro cluster. It's running Redis and it has at rest encryption enabled and in transit encryption enabled. After I save this file, I can use the cube control API to create the resource. I can then use it to describe and maintain the resource as I would any other Kubernetes resource. ElastiCache support for ACK is available in developer preview for download to try it out and give feedback to help us improve it further. Next, let's talk about so the improvements we've made to scalability and availability within ElastiCache. We focus this year on improving the ability for ElastiCache to scale as requested by many customers who had pretty massive workloads that they wanted to run inside ElastiCache. I'm happy to say that we can now launch clusters with up to 310 terabytes of data, supporting 225 million operations per second. This is accomplished under the hood by having 500 nodes within a single cluster. You're free to choose to partition these 500 nodes in multiple ways, from 83 shards, each with five replicas, to 500 shards with zero replicas. More importantly, these clusters are both horizontally and vertically scalable, which allows you to online resize. You can start with just one node today and then scale out to 500 nodes over time as your application makes it big and now requires pretty massive scale. These configurations inherit all the same high availability guarantees that ElastiCache provides for all of its clusters. One of the most requested features we launched this year was Global Data Store. So as background, AWS has been rapidly expanding its worldwide footprint with 77 availability zones in 24 regions, with more on the way each year. One goal of this expansion has been to provide local access to your data wherever you are in the world, and ElastiCache plays a big part of that being an in-memory data store with ridiculously fast access times. Earlier this year, we were excited to announce a fully managed, fast, reliable, and secure cross-region ElastiCache cluster offering. Global data store is important for two main reasons. First, it allows low latency reads for a globally distributed application. If you have application endpoints in multiple regions that operate on the same set of data, then before global data store, you needed to synchronize your Redis clusters across the regions manually, go across regions to access that data, or just tolerate the inconsistency between regions. A globally distributed leaderboard, for example, really needs to be consistent. So maybe you always went across regions to US East 1 where it resided. With Global Data Store, however, ElastiCache will take care of that synchronization for you so you can read the data in your local region wherever you are. Second, it allows disaster recovery across regions. We designed this feature specifically to give you flexibility and recovery in the event of some regional degradation. Any of the secondary clusters can be promoted to primary with full read-write capabilities via an API call from any region, and this promotion typically completes within less than a minute, allowing your application to start working again quickly in the event of some problem. Let's look a little deeper on how Global Data Store is designed. Global Data Store is built in an active-passive mode between regions, meaning there's a, a one writable region at a time. Reads and writes can be taken by the active cluster, while just low latency reads are served by the secondary passive clusters in other regions. The writes that are taken by the primary will flow asynchronously from up to, to up to two secondary regions, meaning that your writes are still sub-millisecond within that primary region. This allows you to have the same eventually consistent data across all regions with measured lags that are typically under one second. Global Data Store clusters have the same scalability properties you'd expect from an ElastiCache cluster. Write capacity can be scaled both horizontally and, horizontally and vertically, allowing up to 500 nodes in each regional cluster. Changes to a cluster in one region are propagated to clusters in other regions, as well in a, in a coordinated fashion so that you can ensure consistency between the regions. Read capacity can be independently scaled in each region depending on how much throughput you expect for reads. So for example, in region one, I can have five replicas, 
where in region two, I can only have one if there's less of a need for high throughput. You can get started with Global Data Store today and learn more about it at our website. To summarize, uh, Alaskash has had a full year of innovative launches to improve performance, security, and availability using the latest Redis features, all the while making the service easier to integrate with existing workloads for management for microservice architectures. We're excited to continue adding features to enable builders to use Elasticache as a low latency, high throughput and memory data store for all of your data access needs. We have ample online resources to answer any questions you may have and regularly publish content in our blog about best practices and architecture patterns that you can use to use Elasticache. Also be sure to check out our other talk at reInvent and learn more about how to use Redis's powerful data structures to do more than just caching. Thank you for your time and enjoy reInvent 2020.